Hey, it's uh, Benjamin Douglas Ray with another edition of Sustainable Cannabis TV. I'm here with Lily from Changemaker Creative. How are you today? I'm pretty good. How about yourself? Doing great. Doing great. Thanks for asking. Uh, this episode <laughs> is brought to you by BuzzFeed, LinkedIn for Leaders Live, and Eight Saints brand uh, products. They're made with Colorado organic high altitude hemp. You can see the links down below in the corner here. So, Lily, um, thanks again for coming on to the show. Where are you? Uh, um, where are you today? I'm in Alameda, California. It's a little island in front of Oakland, California. Awesome. Yeah. So, is that is that where the the bridge comes between the two? Is that the 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 island that's directly in the bay? No, we're um, a bit towards the side. Um, a little bit of a hidden place, like even locals don't always know where I live when I say that I'm in Alameda. If you've been to the Oakland airport, you've actually been in Alameda. Got it. Awesome. Cool. How's the, <laughs> how's the weather been out there? Oh, uh, we had a bit of a crazy like rainstorm and caught a little bit of snow like in lower altitudes. So we were actually with a friend, we drove off to like look for snow <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> just to see some, but we didn't find any it had melted already. Oh, that's, that's kind of fun. Well, uh, here in Colorado, it's supposed to snow today, so I'll take a picture for you. It's nice. And I'm, I'm originally from Scandinavia. I'm Finnish. So like, it's not like I've never seen snow, but it does have a little bit of a kind of homey feel to me. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, cozy. Well, good. Well, tell us uh, a bit uh, for the viewers and listeners, what got you into this business, into the cannabis packaging mm -hmm. business? And tell us about Changemaker Creative. Sure. So I got into the business in 2016. Um, I had been working for the past decade in social justice and environmental nonprofits and had kind of a couple of clients who were doing sustainable consumer products. And I was like, ah, oh, that, that's kind of more fun. I'm a little tired of the nonprofit fundraising calendar and like organizing my life around it. So I want to do more products and at the same time, California was moving towards like recreational cannabis, like legislation that happened in 2018. So I was like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump into there. Um, I knew very little of cannabis at the time. So I tried it a couple of times, didn't actually like it that much. <laughs> so I started testing different products on my own and with a friend and yeah, realized that I really enjoy it. and. There's a lot more variety than what I tried in college. So I really got into it. And now I'm like the biggest advocate for <laughs> CBD and cannabis and um, said goodbye to nonprofit work and am doing mostly packaging and branding design for mostly cannabis and hemp products. So, so are you seeing that a lot of the a lot of, is it more CBD now coming online in hemp or is it more uh, THC cannabis? Uh, most of my clients are California cannabis, but definitely like the CBD side is just it's a tiny bit simpler with less regulations. So I'd, I'd love to work on a couple of um, national chains where I could do some hemp stuff. Mm -hmm. So is the so at Changemaker Creative, do you do the the packaging or do you do the labeling as well and all of the, you know, kind of all the regs on there? So you have to deal with different jurisdictions or what are the mm -hmm. services that you guys provide? Yeah, so I do the design and help you help um, find the physical packaging. Like I don't manufacture anything myself, but I have tons of vendors who I work with to find like the right container and right child resistant container for your product. And yeah, I the compliance part is a big deal. Um, I have a big checklist that I go through for every product. For I've mostly done California. I have a couple of hemp products that are outside of California. So I've yet to have to learn too many states, but um, I'm learning Missouri regulations now so I can do a packaging for Missouri. That's exciting. Um, Cause of course every state is different. And you know, have you, do you find in California, I guess for the viewers and listeners, are the, are the different 
areas of California, do they have different rules around packaging, like the different regions with different attorney generals, or is it one solid like like a lot of states are for the, the, the whole state? at least the state regulations. Yeah, it's it's the same regulations for the entire state. Um, how stringent vendors are in those regulations seems to, in my experience, vary a little because there's like the regulations and then there's how we understand them. Hmm. And a lot of dispensaries have their own kind of checklist. And if you, even if you're regulations wise um, doing all the things, they have their own things that you must meet for them to feel comfortable enough to take your product on. So it is, it is a bit of a dance. Do you, do you see that there, that dispensaries are going over and above the, what the regulations need to be because they just feel it's the right thing to do uh, versus just yeah. doing the bare minimum to meet the regulations to get product on the shelf? Oh, they go above and beyond like, because I think they have the most to lose if they were to be found to be non-compliant. So I think they're going a little above and beyond. Like, mm. as an example, we have a um, Prop 65 warning requirements that are, it's a warning that says like, warning this product can cause cancer and reproductive harm. And the regulations say that the, there's like a big arrow with, with an exclamation point um, that that thing can be black and white, but the regulations say yellow, unless you don't want to do yellow, then it can be black and white. So of course, all the vendors want you to have a big yellow triangle warning on your package because that's what the regulations say. Got it. Yeah, so you really have to work with just the not only the local jurisdictions, but the companies and yeah. the dispensaries to really understand what exactly you need to put on these labels just so they'll mm -hmm. be compliant and, and can work on the shelves. Yeah. And how to fit it all. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that can be a challenge sometimes, especially up in Canada, we've seen. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to uh, get into some sustainability uh, questions yes. for you. The, um, you know, that's really what we talk about here is sustainable practices within the cannabis industry. And I know that you, you've got some statistics on, where the cannabis industry is headed based on other kind of consumer um, you know, brands. Can you talk a bit about that as where, where we're headed in this industry based on the trends you're seeing? Yeah, I've seen some really interesting data come out in the past couple of years on the consumer product side. So where sustainable products used to be kind of a niche thing that you might buy at like a local eco hippie co-op store now it's like super mainstream so the one of the biggest things that i found is that currently sustainably marketed products while they're only 16 percent of the overall uh, food and personal care product markets it's that 16 percent that is driving over 54 percent of the growth mm. so majority of the growth of new products in that big sector is like a teeny tiny slice of it is driving most of the growth. Hmm. I think that's really interesting. And is that in beauty products? I mean, what do you, what do you yeah. start leading in? Yeah, it's, it's personal care. So it's like shampoos and beauty and also food. So any, everything from flour to drinks and like, it's, it's pretty much everything. And do you know, is that from just the companies saying we want to do this or consumer demand in your, your, your study? I think it's a bit of both. I think it's, um, so in another survey, I saw that people were saying that over 80% of people say that they do consider stuff like that when making a purchase, like they would switch, say they would switch to a purpose driven brand. So I think it's just about making those sustainable options more prominent like you see a lot more companies put the stuff on the packaging like all the sustainability cred that they do and also like the consumer base is changing like the um, even baby boomers say that they care about sustainability but the percentages around like baby boomers and older is a bit smaller 
than on when you get to like millennials and Gen Z where it is like the 80, 80 91% say that it's, it's a big factor on how they choose which product to buy. So over time, as, as those generations start becoming more powerful with their mm -hmm. purchasing, um, you know, not just habits, but the, the sheer power of it, that really is gonna drive this forward. And it right. seems like cannabis is following that. Where, where is the cannabis now in terms of that? Have you seen that and that's gonna lead to more to that 16% uh, that's driving, you know, 50 some percent of the-, the Yeah. Product? Um, in cannabis, it's still a bit of a, we don't, we don't know, we don't have that data. So I'm looking forward to having actual data, but it seems that currently with the cost of like, let's, if we talk about sustainable packaging and not just sustainable everything, we talk about sustainable packaging, it's still unsure whether consumers are willing to pay a dollar more for a pre-roll that is in a sustainable package versus the one that's not. But we also don't know that they don't. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we just don't know. Um, and I've seen a, a lot of my clients are very sustainably driven. And when I tell them these statistics, they're like, okay, now we feel more comfortable paying that couple of cents more per package because it's it matters to us and we're gonna have to see if it matters to our clients and if you make that part of your sustainability story and your marketing story how you're sustainable because i don't think most consumers feel really good about the amount of cannabis packaging waste that they have to deal with and like in california most of us just had to get just something on the shelves in 2018, 2019. But now it's time to like rethink and see if you could do something better than the bare minimum that got you got you back on the shelves. Yeah, I mean, it's still just, it's really a young industry. It's really only mm -hmm. been a couple of years in the scope of things. And we do have an opportunity now to really look at things and say, how are we going to make this better? Because you're right, a lot of companies just need to get anything on the shelf with mm -hmm. a big container, just plastic container, just to, to get going. Right. But now there's an opportunity, you know, to really think about that. You know, your, your comment about that a lot of the customers you talk about, they kind of want to see other companies doing it first or say, oh, yes, the, this is kind of a trend. So I can I can start to look at these options as there haven't been ones before. Um, you know, I think companies do care and there there is an ongoing debate, you know, in mm -hmm. all the posts I do about how much will consumers pay extra. Right. And some studies show that they'll pay a lot more. Some say that they won't pay more at all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are other comments about, well, the companies need to absorb that. Others say, no, we're going to pass that to the consumer right. because if they believe in it, they will pay more. And I think it's just an ongoing, um, you know, opportunity to reduce costs in general. You know, mm -hmm. and that's what I've talked about a lot is finding ways to be extremely innovative and cut the price in half. You know, I mean, it's a right. big challenge and I'm really just saying less packaging should be less cost all up and down the supply chain. So that's just something that we need to work toward. And this morning I was thinking as a challenge for you know myself and a, and a challenge for the viewers and listeners is the month of February, what I'm going to do is every single thing that I buy, I'm gonna to try to say, I don't need that secondary package. So if I go into the store and I'm, let's just say I'm buying vitamins, some vitamins are in a mm -hmm. package with inside another package right next to ones that aren't. Mm -hmm. And so I need to make that conscious effort and commit to saying, I'm not gonna buy things with a secondary package. So right. for me, that is a way to reduce packaging by half is to do away with the secondary package. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for companies to do that, for individuals to do that, for, for governments, let's say, to do that and not mandate that there mm -hmm. may be a, a secondary package. So it's taking some time, but I think I think we're gonna get there. You know, yeah. I. I, I think that that uh, uh, you have said that two thirds of, of people you talk to or have read care about sustainability. And I, I would say that almost everybody cares, but mm -hmm. how many people are willing to do something about it? And that that's really the key here that I'd like to know is 
what are your thoughts on that? You know, we can all care, but right. when it comes to spending more, doing more, thinking more, what what's your opinion about that? Well, I've seen like there's of course tons of different statistics, but I think the statistic around the uh, millennials and Gen Z, eighty percent of them at least claim that they would pay more. Um, I think the percentage was like sixty five percent among all consumers surveyed would pay more for a sustainable product. But what that statistic didn't tell me was like how much more. So or who actually did it? You know, there's right, different right. people saying I would versus right. I did. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. But yeah, like the point that you made is a really good one. Like sustainable packaging doesn't necessarily mean like the most exotic material. It might mean just doing less packaging and doing like doing a smart design where you're using much less material. That's of course, that's the original sustainable packages. The package that doesn't exist. <laughs> right, exactly. And like choosing renewable materials, choosing lightweight materials that are done locally, not shipped from overseas. Like there's tons of stuff you can do that aren't like, let me buy that really expensive hemp plastic thing. Mm -hmm. Hemp plastic is awesome, but it's also pricey sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it'll take a while to, to, to get the prices down. I think it mm -hmm. will happen, but it's, yeah. I mean, would you, you know, that that's an interesting point because if you just say, oh, this is hemp made out made from hemp, but then let's just say that it had to be wrapped with five times as much plastic bubble wrap to get it here. Right. You know, you have to really think about the whole the whole picture in there. Mm -hmm. No, I've got there's a question here from a comment from Brad Levin. Tough with brand loyalty to make that choice. Now he's referring to what we talked about switching, you know, to the different brands. And my, my comment on that is, you know, I think that that's maybe positive because um, while I might be attracted to this one brand, let's just say it's an Apple phone. And there was a comment mm -hmm. the other day, someone's like, what do you do with the boxes? You know, they're so nice. You don't want to throw them away. And they're so, right. you know, cool. You use them, but do you ever really use them? And there's incredible brand loyalty around, you know, Apple, but there's also all this waste too. So I think there's a real opportunity for companies to say, you know, I want your brand loyalty and I'm going to be transparent about why I'm using less packaging. So that is a way to use that brand story as you were talking about, especially with millennials and Gen Z and mm -hmm. baby boomers to some extent to really rewrite that story about why it's so important not to have this cool looking box that you just keep on your shelf and don't want to throw away because it's just right. a box that you don't want to throw away. So, you know, what do you feel about that with brand loyalty in terms of caring about sustainability? Yeah, and like one thing that I'm really excited about is the idea of refills. Like if you're making a beautiful, say like a pre-roll tin, your customers don't have to buy that every single time. You could just sell them the fancy tin once and then refills to fill it with because like the tin itself is like two dollars mm -hmm. so if you can pass those savings in the refill size for your customers they'll feel better about it and it's it's a nice thing that they feel guilty throwing away but then again like you said like you don't need 15 lovely boxes i have a whole closet because i hoard boxes right i, I never I, use them but i don't I, want to I throw them away do. you think this is a really nice box i'm going to keep it i'm going to do the right thing i'm going to yeah. reuse it but then it sits empty stacked in your closet right there's a pretty interesting uh, example of those on in yogurt so um yo play made this glass like an old-timey yogurt thing where it's a glass thing and an aluminum thing and they made it because they were like, okay, let's recycle and it's gonna be a plastic free yogurt cup. Well, what they didn't see happening is that it's now a super craft people thing. Like those yogurts sell out in stores because people make craft projects with them. There's like a whole TikTok yo play cup thing mm -hmm. happening <laughs> where it's like a, where it has a life of its own where people make like succulent planters out of those yogurt cups. So that was an unexpected 
reusability thing where they thought they were making a recyclable product, but what they actually ended up with was a highly sought after re like alternate use. Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of a cool thing if you're a, a brand marketer to really not just market the original product, but to market kind of the aftermarket, you know, right. options for that. That's pretty cool way to think about it. Well, you know, when, when we were talking earlier, we were talking about kind of carbon footprint and, mm -hmm. you know, that hemp package that that is wrapped, you know, let's talk about the, just packaging in general. And um, I know some some things that you've talked about before is that sometimes those costs um, could be half or your carbon footprint um, can be half half or twice as much mm -hmm. um, with the packaging. So if you could talk about that, that's pretty interesting as well. Yeah, so that's a, that, that was something that was pretty shocking to me. So in a product, the overall carbon footprint from like make, growing the product, manufacturing the product, and then putting it in a package, over half of its carbon overall carbon footprint might be the packaging, like in beauty products. And like, I think it was like beer, it was more like 60% of the overall carbon footprint of the whole thing is just the package alone. So even if you don't end up doing super sustainable everything elsewhere, you can do quite a bit with your package choices. So choosing like less material and renewable materials when you do and choosing shopping local will be will be a good thing. Yeah, you know, the, when I was thinking earlier about kind of the challenge, uh, the, the February challenge, as I'm calling it for me, you know, to mm -hmm. uh, just be much more aware of that. It, and it also goes up to corporations too, you know, I'm saying to uh, CEOs to challenge uh, them to say, if you believe in sustainability, mm -hmm. put that in your five-year plan and make it public. You know, don't, don't just talk about it in a you know, over Zoom or something with right. your team, actually make it public. And, you know, that way, when we really start to get things in the public dialogue, even if you don't make your goals, at least you're you're saying we're trying. And that's, yeah. what, uh, that's what's important is to really look at these issues. And the, the third thing that I'm calling for here is for companies, especially cannabis companies that have a lot of information that they hold completely tight, you know, close to mm -hmm. the best is to communicate and cooperate all up and down the supply chain because there for sure are savings between the you know two disciplines because if you're just doing what you're doing and and up and down the stream are doing what they're doing you you you're not going to get as much operational efficiency when you're you know when you're not working together so that's my third kind of charge and challenge is for mm -hmm. companies to share collaborate communicate and really work together so that we can right. drive this industry forward in a positive way. Yeah, and with packaging especially, like it's not super easy for a single manufacturer to have like something custom designed and manufactured because those manufacturing runs need to be like in the hundreds of thousands. But if we band together and support the more sustainable options, those sustainable options will then become more accessible in, in pricing. And like, I see a lot of people talk about sustainability as if it's only like the kind of lights that you use and how much water you use. But if over half of your carbon footprint is from your packaging materials, that's not even counting like your shipping bubble wrap and all that stuff. Like that can be a big part of your sustainability story. Right, right. I mean, any company that's that cares needs to do those studies. You know, right. I, I know it would be a challenge, but as we were talking uh, with Fri Friday with John about these studies and the day before with uh, with uh, other John, really these studies and these calculators about mm -hmm. what you can do, or at least an audit, what you're doing now and what you can be doing, whether it's electricity, light, uh, packaging, to do that work ahead of time, mm -hmm. really will say, oh man, I didn't know that there was this much money that I was, you know, essentially wasting throwing right. away where I could use that to be more innovative or cooperate or, you know, um, you know, save money in other areas. And I think that that's going to be a, a big thing going forward is the are these sustainability studies, audits, mm -hmm. 
calculators, which are really going to help people completely understand because, you know, unless you were specialized in, right. in doing this, how would you ever know, you know, if yeah. a, a company who says, I want a very cool package. I want a really great label to sell my product. How would you ever know? Yeah. Like a couple of years ago, I didn't know that compostable label um, glue is a thing. So, and now I, like I had, I had no idea that the glue behind your paper sticker might still not be compostable as an example. So it can be pretty, uh, it's funny, like it hasn't been sunny in so long that I didn't realize it's going to be sunny today, <laughs> California weather. Um, so like knowing all those cool things that are possible is what I, I spend my days looking for all this cool stuff so I can then share with my clients and kind of we can then do an informed decision because it's such a bummer if you have like a beautifully sun-grown clean green certified thing that you grow and then you just put it in a plastic tube tube that's just meh right yeah it, it doesn't make sense i mean if you're gonna if you're i mean it is ultimately about the product inside granted mm -hmm. that but if you care about sustainability, it's everything leading up to that right. and then everything after as right. well. Yeah, of course, I'd love from? to Where's see. Where's it going, that package? Yeah, I'd love to see more recycling and more like take back programs and refills, but currently at least like the regulations are kind of hindering that, but regulations are something that can be changed. They're not permanent, so. Yeah, and, we, and we've, seen that a lot. we've seen that yeah. in Colorado. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've we changed relatively quickly in terms of machine size and 10 milligrams. Like those mm -hmm. things changed fairly quickly, you know, with, with over a couple of years in terms of the regulations. And I know that, you know, regulators, for the most part, want to work with the industry because the more that it's legitimized and legal, uh, it's better for everyone. So, you know, regulations, you know, are there. They don't seem like it always, but they're there really to help everyone. And compliance is to mm -hmm. help everyone be and do a better job. So I think that as we start to see these kind of ar archaic, you know, and uh, archaic in the in the right. short sense here, rules in terms of packaging size and labeling and what we have mm -hmm. to do, we're, we're starting to see that these things don't need to be that way. And those will change over time, you know, every couple of years. And I'm really looking forward to that when the regulators really start to think about sustainability, because that yeah. way that compliance is gonna say, you know, not only do you have to be child resistive, but you also have to be sustainable, much like Canada and Mexico are saying mm -hmm. their, you know, federal laws, national laws, it has to be sustainable and child resistive. Right. They don't really define sustainability, you know, so, but at least they're saying, it needs to be that way so that people can start to think about it. So now if consumers, let's say you're in Canada, you you say, yeah, we're going to go toward more paper. We're going to go toward more glass, mm -hmm. less plastic. So I get way more comments from Canada about sustainability than I do from the United States with all mm -hmm. of our, you know, hundreds of different jurisdictions and different rules. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about earlier. So it is changing. It will change, but it does take some time. Yeah, and one thing that I would love to see is like getting a tax credit for a cannabis company if you opt for sustainable, both growing and your packaging. Like that could make it a kind of a reverse incentive to mm -hmm. do it and offset some of the costs. Oh, yeah. I mean, energy credits, we were talking yeah. about CO2 the other day, but that's great for packaging. And I'm looking forward to the day, much like, you know, craft breweries here where you'd have you have a brewery, then you can buy, you know, let's say a growler and you can take it mm -hmm. home, can bring it back, you know, much like kegs. You know, we don't have that option here with uh, with the different licenses. Right. But it would be cool to have a dispensary uh, next to a MIP so it could be made. You bring your, you know, your container back then they stamp on there, put the stamp on it's regulated so you can see that it goes into a child mm -hmm. package and then you take it home. That's not there yet, but I think that is going to come in the next, I don't know, three to four years. It's something that should happen. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And like, it's kind of silly when you think about it, like California, the same year that California banned plastic single use straws and plastic bags, they demanded that cannabis does exit bags. <laughs> Like, <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, it's, you know, it's, I think, I think, I guess we just have to be, well, I don't want to use the word patient, but I guess we have to be understanding that, you know, things are moving in the right direction. Yeah. Slower than we'd like, but they're starting to move in the right direction. So yeah. We, and we need to force them to move, move along because regulators, they're scared. So they don't want to do any wrong moves. So they right. are going to be overly cautious. And I think with us being around for several years now, we can show that like nothing bad has happened and we can then start rolling back some of those packaging regulations because they they were a bit overkill. Like, yep. Yeah, I mean, new industry and overly yeah. cautious, I agree. So it's getting better. Well, uh, Lily, I want to thank you for your time. I'd like to know how people can get a hold of you if they'd mm -hmm. like to, to learn more about what you do. What's the best way? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn a lot, so you can find me here. Um, and my website, changemakercreative.com. There's a button there that you can book a call with me. I love to talk to people on the phone. And yeah, email, um, Instagram messages. I rarely ever check, but I am on Instagram. Yeah. God, good, good. Well, what are you excited about this year? Working uh, on? This year, um, I am working on a hemp version of one of my clients, uh, Green Bee Botanicals. We're a cannabis infused skincare line. So we're finally doing a hemp version that we can ship around. So I, we're going plastic free with our packaging. Awesome. Well, that's a good, good direction. Mm -hmm. well, thanks again for your time. If there are any uh, viewers out here who would like to listen to this, these, uh, these episodes are available on uh, on Spotify, Google, and Apple Apple Podcasts. So thanks again, Lily. Have a great day. I look forward to speaking with you soon. Bye.